Hello and welcome to our next segment as we dive into uh, the content of the Lord's Prayer. And we begin with the introduction, Our Father in Heaven. Um, every prayer has some form of introduction, right? If we're offering a prayer, that means that we're, we're turning to someone outside of ourselves for help, for guidance, or to give thanks for the things that we have received. Jesus is teaching us and giving us the Lord's Prayer that as his disciples, when we pray, we don't pray to the universe or to the heavens. We pray to the God who he calls Father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Our prayers are meant to be particular. And when we pray, we should never be ashamed to pray to the God in whom we trust, knowing that that our Jewish or Muslim or Hindu neighbors or anyone else who offers prayer um, will be praying to the God whom they worship. Right In this, we don't seek to offend one another, but we work to be genuine in our own worship and in our own devotion, in our own prayer, in our own faithfulness, just as our neighbors from other faith traditions will seek to do so in their own lives. When we come to this introduction, Luther says that God tenderly urges us to believe that he is our true father and that we are his true children so that we may ask God confidently with all assurance as dear children ask of their dear father. And I want you to notice the plural language there. We say our father, not my father. This prayer is the prayer of God's people, and in it we are invited to address the God and Father of all creation, reminding us that when we pray, we don't just pray for ourselves, but we also keep in mind all those around us who also seek to know God's favor and blessing in their life. Remember the words of Jesus from Luke's Gospel. If those who are evil know how to give good gifts to their children. How much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit, the gifts of God, to those who ask Him? In this introduction, we understand that our prayers are being trusted to God, believing that when we pray, the things that we pray for will be heard and answered by God our Father. Our prayers, then, should be offered in faith in trust, because otherwise they're empty words with no meaning and no relationship with the God to whom we pray. When we pray, we should trust that God not only hears us, but promises to answer us. Otherwise, what are we doing? Which then brings us to what we actually do when we pray the Lord's Prayer. Coming to the first petition, hallowed be your name. Um, Hallowed is an old English word that means to keep holy. And we remember that um, Halloween, right? The October 31st comes from All Hallows Eve, which is the night before All Saints Day, the day to remember God's holy people. Um, this first petition, Hallowed Be Your Name, is both a statement, God is holy, God is separate, God is other and different from us, but also a request. Help us, God, to keep your name holy. And so with this petition, we're not only uh, keeping the first commandment by turning to God and having no other gods in prayer, but the very first thing that Jesus tells us to ask for is that we keep the second commandment. Think about that for a second. Luther said that this is done when the word of God is taught in its truth and its purity, and we as God's children also leave holy lives in accordance with that word. To this end, God, help us. But Jesus also teaches that the one who teaches and lives otherwise, apart from God's word, lives and teaches in such a way that the name of God is not kept holy. From this we ask, dear God, preserve us, keep us from doing these things. The first thing that Jesus teaches us to pray for is 
is that God help us keep the first three commandments. God instructs us through Jesus to lead holy lives in keeping with the word of God. That's what we understand in the third commandment, to honor the Sabbath. And on that, on down the line, if we're transformed in prayer to be people who are shaped by those three commandments, then in turn we're also being shaped to live out the other seven, that our entire lives be changed in prayer to keep God's commandments and to be changed for the glory of God. Which brings us right into the second petition, your kingdom come. In this, we pray we pray that God's kingdom come, remembering that Jesus' ministry was marked by his preaching that the kingdom of God is near. And we were reminded that his teachings and his parables are all about life in God's kingdom. God's kingdom isn't a physical space. It's a, a rule. It's a reign. It's a way of life what life looks like when God is our king, the king who instructs us how to live, who protects us, and who offers us mercy and blessing as his children. Luther says that the kingdom of God comes, indeed, without our prayer, without our even asking for it. It comes on its own. But we pray in this petition that it may come to us also. And this happens when our Heavenly Father gives us His Holy Spirit, so that by His grace, His favor, we believe and trust His Holy Word and lead a godly life here in time and there into eternity. We receive the gift of the Holy Spirit most prominently in the gift of baptism, but also throughout the duration of our lives, knowing that as we pray, Your kingdom come, God is already bringing that kingdom into the world because God has come to be with us. And we look and we turn to God in this gift, trusting that God's word, Jesus, who is revealed to us in the words of Scripture, leads us and teaches us how to live a holy life, a life that's set apart for God's purposes, which sounds a lot like what we just prayed for in the first petition. So we can see God's kingdom coming into the world when God's name and God's people are kept holy. We pray for this because we trust that with God's kingdom come into the world, we are made into the people that God creates us to be, and we know and experience blessings fuller and deeper than without God's presence in our lives. God's kingdom comes to us without ever asking for it in the first place, but we pray for it so that our eyes might be opened and our ears eager to hear, recognizing that God's kingdom is taking up space in this world and that our bodies are prepared to share the good news of this kingdom with others. It's all about our relationship with God, with our neighbor, as we share God's blessings in our lives. The third petition, your will be done on earth as in heaven. This petition recognizes that God's will is already carried out. But we ask and pray that it be experienced here and now as we live, not just in heaven or in the future. Luther says this means that the good and gracious will of God is done, indeed, again, without our prayer. But we pray that it may be done among us also. And this is done when God breaks and disrupts and stops every evil counsel and will which would not let us keep God's name holy nor let God's kingdom come. For example, such as the will of the devil, the world, and our own fleshly desires. And this happens when God strengthens and keeps us steadfast in his word and in faith up to our very end. This is God's gracious and good will. A lot packed in there, and, and I think it's a good place to start to recognize that we, we normally talk about having free will, right? And we think of it as the ability to act or not to act in a certain way. I'm free to kind of do whatever it is I want. But that's very different than the way that we talk about it in the church when we pray God's will be done. A person's will 
isn't their ability to act. A person's will is their desire. Think more like willpower or the driving force behind someone's desire to do something. When we talk about God's will or our own, it has more to do with what's behind our actions and our impulses than it does with what it is we actually do. When we pray God's will be done, what we're asking is that God's desire for us and for the world come into being in such a way that we may work to help others know God's desire for them as well. In that sense, we don't really agree with having free will because what we're asking is that God's desires become our own, that we are bound and tied up to God's will. Remember these words from Paul in Philippians chapter 2, verses 2 to 8. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of humans. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. We should hesitate a little bit when we pray God's will be done. Because in asking God for this, we're asking that God take over our lives and be the willpower behind all of our thoughts, all of our words, and all of our deeds. Trusting that God's will is shown most clearly in the love of Jesus, who didn't fight back, who didn't lash out, who didn't consider his own safety, but who allowed himself to be betrayed and captured and crucified and killed, all to show us that sacrificial love is the way and the will of God, to which God put the final stamp on that by raising Jesus from the dead on the third day. That's the depths of God's love and God's will for our lives. As Christians, we understand that our desires are either influenced by God or by sin, death, and the devil, the things that tempt us in this life away from God. And therefore, our will isn't really truly free or ours to begin with. We're captive to the temptations of this world or we're captive to the desires of God for this world. Our actions, absolutely, though, those are free. God doesn't pull a string to make uh, to make me pick up a cup, right? Satan doesn't poke me with a stick to make me knock over a chair or uh, harm my sibling, right? We do have control over our bodies, but our desires, the things that we crave, the things that drive us, our will is led by either God or the enemy, and our actions then follow suit. And so in this petition, Jesus is teaching us to pray that God would help us to follow the ninth and 10th commandments, that our desires not be to covet what belongs to our neighbor or to build ourselves up, but that our desires be like God's, to condemn evil, to care for the poor and the oppressed, and to speak the truth of God's kingdom, even when being faithful may cause us harm, to show love even when it's undeserved. Like God's kingdom, God's will or desire comes without us even asking for it, but we pray for it so that our eyes and our ears will be open to recognize God's desire for this world taking place here and now, and that our bodies be prepared to follow God's desires instead of our own, and to share the good news of this kingdom with others. It's all about our relationship with God, with our neighbors, and how we share God's blessings together.